Sure, they'll trade away star players, like how they shipped off Glasnow, Margot, and Rayleigh. But they've always seemed to find a way to make it work. The Tampa Bay Rays look once again to be among the league's best in 2024, as they push for another playoff appearance. Wait. In April 2024, I released a little series, you might have heard of it. It's called The History of the Tampa Bay Rays. And yeah, it got a little popular. Much love and thanks for watching, of course. But at the end of it all, I expressed my optimism for the future and the upcoming season. Well, fast forward about six months, and the channel's grown quite a lot. I've made a bunch more sports videos, and I've hopefully gotten better at this whole editing thing. And yeah, shoutouts to YouTube for blocking a couple videos for a bit five months after they were uploaded. That's just awesome. And the Rays? Well, uh, they played baseball in 2024. Throughout 25 years, the Tampa Bay Rays have been through quite a lot, with some incredible highs and devastating lows. But despite it all, time pushes us forward. And so it's time for year 26 of the Rays experience. Uh, but with this season's team, how are you feeling about it? I mean, can't really say much because it's, yeah, it's only been like 13 games. And of course, you know, some people are like, they suck, it's over. Nah, they're going to be a playoff team at minimum. Yeah, that aged well. Things started practically like any other year, as right after coming off one of the most crushing playoff losses in franchise history, they looked to retool and hopefully make it work this time. I mean, six times the charm, right? While guys like Tyler Glasnow and Manuel Margot were shipped off, they looked to turn it around with the introductions of Ben Rortvet, Richie Palacios, Johnny DeLuca, and Ahmed Rosario. Curtis Mead would serve as a backup to Isak at third, and Jose Caballero would hopefully be better than Walls at short. And Ryan Pepio and Tyler Alexander were set to fill out the rotation, along with Eflin, Littell, and Civale. They had some other guys, like how they signed Naoyuki Uwasawa to try out for the team, only to end up missing out, which led to him leaving for Boston. They also brought in Phil Maton and Jacob Wagespach, as relievers to fill out a cast of characters that, at first glance, are just pretty average. Like, yeah, everyone predicted the Rays to be okay this year, but they have always exceeded expectations. That's literally their M.O. Surely they can do it again. Well, they would kick off the 2024 season in the best possible way, by having Eflin shit himself in an 8-2 loss to the Blue Jays, in what would start a truly disastrous outing for the pitching staff. In March and April, Rays pitchers would combine for a 4.54 ERA, which, dear god, giving up 9 runs on back-to-back -back days, 11 against the Giants, and 10 against Colorado in what would become an absolute shit show of a game, where going into the ninth down 6-2, the offense would put on a clinic as four straight hits would load the bases, and Rortvet would tie the game with a two-run single. Then Siri would reach on an error to take the lead against Ray's legend Jalen Beeks, completing the comeback. Until Fairbanks came in and walked three people in a row and then gave up a nuke. He would blame the baseball quality for his performance, and over the next couple weeks he would continue to struggle, as on April 17th he would blow it once more against the Angels. It would soon come out that their child had passed away in gestation due to Turner Syndrome before the season. It's truly a tragedy and understandably it was affecting Pete's performance on the field, but luckily he was able to make a difference as for every strikeout he threw, he would donate to the Turner Syndrome Foundation, 
as he would raise over $43,000 over the course of the season. While the pitching struggled, the offense did their best to keep them above water, as while Rort, Rosario, and Cabby would have good starts to the year, Yandi would fall well below expectations, hitting 220 in this time right after winning the batting title. Once again, it seemed like the entire team was cold at the same time. But no one had it worse than Randy Arosarena, who would hit an abysmal 143 in April and 178 in May, as it seemed his value to the team was starting to diminish. It would all come to a head in late April, as the Rays traveled to Chicago to face the White Sox. Now, the White Sox were not a good team. In fact, coming into this series, they had three wins in the season. Three. But what followed is a truly unholy series of events. Where they got slapped in Game 1, and the offense was shut down in Game 3. But it was Game 2 that was the most egregious. It was a back and forth affair, where a cabby single and a Richie homer was answered by Ben Intendi hitting one of his own to tie the game. Then right after, Austin Shenton would hit his first homer in the big leagues but Chicago would put up three more in the fifth off Savale and Armstrong being poopy shit ass. However, right after that, Randy would hit a two-run double to once again tie the game, where it would remain as the teams headed into extra innings. Now, you remember how I said me and my family would go out to see the Rays play in every ballpark? Well, this year, we went to Chicago, and on April 27th, 2024, my ass was sitting on those stands on the third base side, watching these events unfold. Sure, this game was a complete train wreck, but in the 10th, the Rays would jump out again, as a wild pitch would bring in Richie to make it 7-6. Thankfully, the Rays were able to put it away as they avoided losing to the Chicago White Sox of all teams. I mean, come on. Who would even do that? Ben Intendi! Get it out! Let's go! The White Sox lock it off in the 10th! The Tampa Bay Rays were swept by the Chicago White Sox. You know, I don't think you understand the severity of that statement. Let me repeat it. The Tampa Bay Rays were swept by the Chicago White Sox. The team who would go on to have a legendarily bad year, one of the worst teams in MLB history, and the Rays were swept by them. Even when they played them later, they only won the series two to one. So Chicago still won the season series four to two. Almost 10% of their total wins came against the Rays. The team who could only put up about 3 runs per game put up 28 against Tampa Bay in 6 games! For fuck's sake, this is the team they lost to! The White Sox would lose 121 games! The worst team in MLB history and the Rays got swept by them! Are you fucking kidding me? This is beyond embarrassing! If this was any indication, it was that the 24 Rays were going to suck. And indeed, they did. Their run differential was the fifth worst in the AL, and they were literally the worst team in the league with runners in scoring position. Yes, worse than the damn White Sox. They probably also led the league in popouts in foul territory. And since there's no way to verify that, I'm just gonna say that it's true. 
everything points to this team being absolutely terrible. And yet, they weren't, as a combination of factors led to them being merely okay. Despite their record, they were actually really good in close games, going 30-22 and 22 in one-run contests. Against some teams, like the White Sox, Orioles, and Rangers, they totally stunk. But against others, they played well, like the Yankees, Diamondbacks, and Mets. They spent the year hovering around 500, never falling more than five games under, and never rising more than three games over. They would finish the year at 80 and 82. And yeah, that's the 2024 Rays. At a surface level, because wowee is there a lot more to talk about. There's nothing to say about how badly or greatly this team played because they kinda just existed. Instead, let's recount the year through an array of fun and interesting stories. Moments that make the Rays truly the Rays. So yeah, that White Sox series, that was definitely something, wasn't it? I mean, seeing that in person was just astounding. I guess that's just my luck when it comes to these trips. I mean, in 2022, I got to see basically the same thing happen against the Reds. And in 2019, hey, remember when the Rays blew a 7-0 lead in Toronto? Yeah, I was there for that one. And in 2017, I got to watch Blake Snell shit all over the mound in Pittsburgh. So that's just lovely. And hey, at least the Rays weren't the only ones swept by the worst team in MLB history. They would finish April with a 14-17 record, and they found themselves in an unfamiliar place, the bottom of the division. But hope was not lost, as they would soon be bestowed the greatest uniforms in all of baseball. When the MLB announced their City Connect line, most teams seemingly just did the bare minimum. I mean, some of these guys really just phoned it in. Like, come on, this shit sucks. But the Rays? Nah, the Rays went all out with the grit and glow. The goddamn Skate Ray. A Ray on a skateboard. How is that not the coolest thing on the planet? The jerseys were made to honor the skateboarding culture of St. Pete and the purple, teal, and light green colors just made it so good. And the alternate logo, dubbed the Sky Ray, even has a little homage to the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Clearly, in my totally not biased opinion, this is a truly elite City Connect, and it belongs in S-tier above all these half-assed attempts. They're so good, they boosted the Rays to their best week of the season an absolutely unprecedented five-game winning streak. The debut weekend saw them sweep the Mets, and when they played Chicago again, they kept wearing the jerseys until the magic wore off. But they still remain the greatest thing to come out of the 2024 season. May was a really bipolar month, as that five-game streak was followed up by losing four of their next six then winning four in a row, and then losing six in a row, to basically end the month where they started. Though at least they weren't in last anymore. In fact, they got to dunk on the Jays in what would become the legacy game of Tyler Alexander. Now, Tyler was just okay, he's always been like that his entire career, but on May 17th, he transformed into Super Mario! as he would pitch seven perfect innings in Toronto. However, his bid would be broken up by Danny Jensen singling in the eighth. And then, just to troll a little bit, the Rays gave up three runs to make it a one-run game. Of course, the 2024 Rays would go from throwing a perfect game to almost losing, but luckily, they would come away with the win. Just two weeks later, and Alexander was back in Durham. What an incredible series of events. May also saw the debut of another Alex, perhaps the most perplexing player on the entire 2024 roster. Meet Alex Jackson, a man who would bounce around a few teams before ending up in Durham to start the year. 
When the pinto beans turned out to be spoiled, he would be brought in to back up Rort behind the plate. What followed was just insanity. He would record his first hit in his third game against the Mets, and wouldn't get another one in almost a month. 33 at-bats without a hit dropped his average to an incredible 0.029. Meanwhile, during that time, he would strike out 16 times! In June, he managed to scrape together four hits, getting his average up to 0.07. And finally, on July 25th, his 41st game, he managed to get back over 100 where he actually got all the way up to 131 before settling at 122, before he was DFA'd by the team in early September. In 58 games, he baffled Rays fans for even being on the roster at all. Like, how was this guy able to stay on the team for four months? He literally has the lowest OPS of any catcher with at least 340 plate appearances since 1913. Well, he was at least better at picking off runners, but his defense would also be questionable at times as well, being the victim of several misplays. Um, I mean, there's there's no concern. I mean, teams go through this all the time. This is nothing new. You know, everyone's had their you know highs, everyone's had their lows. Um, you know, like I said, we're just going to keep on going, and we know that you know we're going to come out in a good spot at the end of this. Of course, he stayed anyway, so there's got to be a purpose, right? He was so bad that he was basically the butt of jokes, but there was a reason why he was kept around, and that was due to his number one fan, Taj Bradley. Now, Bradley had spent the last couple years on and off the roster, but 2024 was the year he solidified his place in the rotation, and he would actually play really well, as in a time where Eflin was struggling, Savale couldn't get out of the fifth inning, and everyone else was hurt, Bradley was the one bright spot on the rotation. And well, he and Jackson are basically inseparable. I mean, it was working out as Taj would become the AL Pitcher of the Month in July, throwing a 1.45 ERA in 5 games. I guess if Taj is doing well, there's no harm in having Jackson here. Maybe he'll get better with more experience. Well, shit. Taj has completely fallen off the face of the planet. Okay, then. As for the rest of the staff, well, it was hit or miss. Eflin and Littell would regress after the previous year, and Pepio would be okay, at least, when he wasn't having to deal with a spider injury. They did get to have some reinforcements, as Rasmussen, Springs, and Boz would all return from Tommy John. There were some other notable performances, perhaps for the wrong reason, like Chris Stavinsky and Sean Armstrong being flat out terrible, with the former being DFA'd and the latter ending up being traded. But there were also some great showings, as Adam, Kelly, and Clevenger continued to be solid, and new faces like Manny Rodriguez and Edwin Uceda led to the Rays once again having one of the best bullpens in the league. It was mainly that which carried the team to a pretty good summer, where after they got shit on by Baltimore in a four-game sweep, they would go 11-7 to end June, once again finding themselves dead even at 42-42. and They continued their momentum with a series win against the Royals, Yankees, and Guardians, though getting swept by Texas kinda negated all that forward progress, as they were still 500 at the All-Star break. Aaron Savale, the main prize from the 23 deadline, had proved to be an absolute bust. And in early July, he was flipped to the Brewers for a minor leaguer. Harold Ramirez was also DFA'd and would eventually sign with Washington. At least in 2025, with McClanahan coming back, the pitching will hopefully be back on their feet, right? July would turn out to be a pretty big month, as we saw three big events transpire that would alter the course of the team in the future. First up, the Wander Franco case. Which of course serves as a reminder to how much this dipshit screwed over the team by being a dumbass. And of course, due to legal nonsense, the trial that was supposed to happen was continually delayed, 
as prosecutors looked to place charges. On July 9th, as a wonderful birthday present to me, Franco was formally charged with sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, and human trafficking by the Dominican Republic. Eh, whatever. I was busy hanging out with my boy Raymond. Of course, the actual trial has been pushed back time and time again, but at least he was taken off the restricted list, so he's not getting paid anymore. In late September, it was ruled that the case would go to court, and from there we can finally bid good riddance to this dumbass. Of course, as of recording this, the trial hasn't happened yet, but let it be known that this man single-handedly destroyed any hopes of a good season this year, and decided to throw away $182 million because he took the risk and he loved it. Yeah, have fun rotting in prison, asshole. On a more positive note, there's the ongoing saga of the new stadium, where after they had initially revealed the plans in September 2023, the team and city were hard at work in discussions to get this shit done. A deadline for the vote was set in July, and in the months leading up to it, the decision was still up in the air, as there were numerous groups in protest of the deal. Stu and Co. proposed to put up 700 million of the 1.3 billion deal, with the county and city covering the rest. Not a super great deal, but it could be a lot worse. On top of that, lots of redevelopments, including housing, office space, and other amenities, including building the Woodson African American Museum of Florida, brought the cost up to $6.5 billion. It's a project that will completely transform St. Pete and the greater Tampa Bay area, though of course there were detractors, claiming the city should focus on other issues. But nonetheless, on July 18th, the vote was held, and after nearly 20 years of back and forth bullshit, numerous plans falling through and bad blood boiling between the team, St. Pete, and Tampa, the city officials voted 5-3 to three to approve the Heinz deal to be built next door to the Trop. Two weeks later, the county would follow suit, and finally, the Tampa Bay Rays have a deal to build a new stadium. The Rays have been looking for a new park for over 15 years now, and after many failed attempts and foiled plans, the wait is over. It's happening. It's actually happening. They're scheduling to break ground in January, and by 2028, the Rays will be playing baseball not in Nashville, Portland, Charlotte, or Montreal, but in St. Petersburg. Hell, they even had Longoria come out and support the deal. After retiring from baseball, he would return to the Trop after seven years and throw out the first pitch. It's a moment that we're honestly lucky to have, considering how easily it could have ended poorly. I mean, this same year saw the Oakland Athletics play their final games in the Coliseum before they're shipped off to play in a damn minor league park in Sacramento. Watching that final game in Oakland and seeing all the fans who've grown up watching this team and having it all ripped away by one greedy asshole is just devastating. And yeah, we were very close to having this same thing happen to the Rays. For A's fans, you guys deserved so much better. The athletics will always be rooted in Oakland. And of course, fuck John Fisher for being a little bitch, and fuck Rob Manfred and all the other owners for allowing this to happen. I hope that Vegas deal blows up in their face. But for the Rays, we can finally shut this counter down for good, and we can say that they are indeed here to stay. Now, how did the Rays respond to these developments? Well, Jackson would hit a homer, so that's something. They would go 7-5 to finish the month, but that would be quickly overshadowed by other major news. Over the past few years, the Rays have simply been good, but not good enough. Maybe with how this year was going, it finally hit them that it was time for a change. 
If the Rays wanted to return to World Series contention, they needed to make some big changes. And so, they did what had to be done. Zach Eflin traded to Baltimore, Jason Adam to San Diego, Rosario to LA, Isak Paredes, right after earning his first All-Star nomination, shipped to Chicago. Update the Delbin Young trade tree, it continues! But the biggest blow came in their face of the franchise. Randy Arozarena seems like the prototypical Rays player. He's a guy who came from nothing, and was pretty much nothing, until he was picked up from St. Louis in 2020 and suddenly exploded, putting together a postseason to remember. Since then, he's transformed into a franchise icon, and while his on-field play was never earth-shattering, he still played good enough to earn his recognition. I mean, hell, he was an all-star last year. But the thing that set Randy apart from everyone else was his personality. He is the coolest motherfucker in all of baseball. From when he was shitting on everyone in 2020, to that crazy World Baseball Classic run, to the iconic arms crossed pose. Everyone loved Randy simply for who he was. And he was always willing to give back, whether it be staying behind to sign memorabilia and interact with fans, or putting on a show for his people in Randy Land. He loved the team just as much as the fans loved him. Even despite him regressing in 2024, Randy still made baseball exciting to watch, as even though he did have his fair share of frustrating moments, he always seemed able to pull out some magic when you least expect it. And so, that made July 26th hurt all the more, as in the early hours of the morning, it was announced that he was traded to the Seattle Mariners, in exchange for some minor leaguers. It was a deal that both came out of nowhere, but also seemed inevitable. I mean, this is the Rays, who never keep their big name players, and yeah, you can definitely do better than Randy. But the point is, he gave people a reason to come to the games. And with him gone, the Rays will never be the same. But in one last act of goodwill, he decided to pay tribute to his people one last time. After all, that night was Randyland night, and despite the fact that he had to go play for Seattle the next day, Randy Arozarena was at Tropicana Field, not as a player, but as a fan, watching the game and hanging out with Rays fans one last time. It's an act unheard of by any big name player. One more reminder as to why Randy is just so awesome. Wherever he goes from here, I wish him all the best, and thank him for all the great memories. With that, only four players now remain from that 2020 run. Yandy Diaz, Brandon Lau, Pete Fairbanks, and Shane McClanahan. That crazy ride from just four years ago seems like a distant memory. And now with these new deals, it was time for the Rays to look to the future. And it began with one man. Junior Caminero who got his first shot at MLB in late 2023, would be called up in August to truly begin his big league career. And what a show it was. 
While the Rays were playing poopy baseball in the late weeks, Junior was there to give fans a reason to tune in. In his first five games, he would post six hits, and on August 23rd, he would hit his first homer of the year. He quickly jumped out as a potential big name player, being one of the top prospects in the game. I hope, I pray that he lives up to his potential so he can give the Rays a genuine superstar that's not a pedophile. Alongside him, the Rays got a boatload of prospects from all those deals, and a couple major leaguers in Christopher Morell and Dylan Carlson. Whether they actually pan out remains to be seen, as these young guys will take years to develop, and Morell and Carlson have both been just okay so far. But it hopefully points to a brighter future in 2025. In August, the team would go 11-15, and an expected result, but before the year is over, we can at least go over some funny moments. Like how the team suddenly went gangbusters and swept the Diamondbacks, including a walk-off from Lau after Pete blew it in the ninth. And then, two days later, after throwing six no-hit innings, the Rays would go on to blow a 6-0 lead in just amazing fashion as Pete would blow it again. Man, we need to give this guy another stool to destroy. Then, with the game tied and Cabby at third, Siri would try a suicide squeeze bunt, an absolutely astounding decision that, of course, didn't work. Due to divine bullshit, the game continued, as a Jock Peterson single would be answered by a single from Taylor Walls of all people. Shoutouts to him for once again being a resident bumfuck this year. The ball loose, Walsh trying to go to third, and he is out at third base. To the left field. Then in the 11th, the Rays would have the bases loaded with nobody out, only to fucking strike out, strike out, ground out, mother fuck! But it's okay, as Carlson would finally end it in the 12th to round out the stupidest game of the season. In other news, the Rays had the greatest giveaway ever made. Like, come on. This thing is just awesome. They would continue to pretend that they were a competitive team as they entered the gauntlet, and somehow would put up 8-1 in one inning against the Twins? In typical fashion, they had every opportunity to win the series, or even sweep, but offensive woes led to them settling for a split, something they couldn't afford as the Twins were the holder of the third wildcard spot, and they needed to do anything to gain ground in the race. And oh, did I mention that there were like four other teams they also had to worry about? So yeah, that was pretty much the end of the season, and if there was even a sliver of hope left, it would be demolished once and for all, as they would be swept in Philly, including a moment where Uceda would give up five runs and then throw a ball at Castellanos, leading to the bench's clearing and a suspension. At least they were able to beat Baltimore in a series. By mid-September, the curtains had drawn, and for the first time since, I guess, 2017, the last couple weeks were pretty much meaningless baseball. I mean, look at the lineup. It's all a bunch of rookies and prospects. Might as well give them some playing time to get ready for next year. Comparing how I felt in April versus in September is like night and day. Like yeah, the season is almost done, the Rays are out of the playoffs, and the roster is completely different, but whatever man. I'm just here to have some fun. At least we got some cool stuff, like Ryan Pepio using that Spider-Man energy to throw the fifth immaculate inning in franchise history, joining Rafael Soriano, Brad Boxberger, and Jose Alvarado as the only Rays to ever do it. And Robert Stevenson, that one counts. I don't care about the, oh, there was an intentional walk before, therefore it's disqualified. Shut up! In their final homestand, they would at least give their fans a treat by going 5-1 as they slapped the Sox and Jays, before going to Detroit and getting slapped themselves in a sweep that wasn't even close. I mean, these Tigers were the hottest team in baseball, what were we expecting? On September 25th, the Tampa Bay Rays got crushed 7-1 to 
in front of 32,000 amped up fans. And me. What kind of bullshit is it that the two games I went out to this year was the worst loss of the season, and the day the Rays were mercifully eliminated from playoff contention? Maybe I'm just bad luck. But it was over, as the Rays, for the first time since 2018, would be on the couch in October. But hey, things weren't all bad, as they were once again one of the best teams in the league in stolen bases, and Cabby would swipe 44, the most in the AL, at least continuing the time-honored tradition of the Rays being elite at stealing bases, and not much else. In their final series against Boston, the Rays would win the first two games, but in game 162, in what would be a microcosm of the season, the Rays would go 1-for-8 with runners in scoring position, leave 9 on base, and have two defensive errors, as they lost 3-1 to to finish the year at 80-82. At the end of the day, what else can be said about this team? Going from 99 wins to missing the playoffs was certainly not on anyone's minds when coming in, but perhaps this was simply inevitable. This team was kinda due for a regression after last year, but this was unheard of. Sure, we can look at how the Rays went from the best offense in franchise history to the worst in just one year, how they were the least clutch team in baseball how they scored the least runs in a season in their entire history, how their pitching failed them when it was needed, and all the expectations that were let down, and come to the conclusion that this was one of the worst seasons in their entire 26-year existence. I mean, shit, not even the stadium itself was safe from the wreckage. But despite all of that, they were a 500 team. It makes no sense. It defies logic. But the fact is that this shit heap of a baseball team was still in playoff contention up to the final week of the season. Their pitching staff, after that miserable start, once again rounded into the team's bright spot, and the bullpen would be electric in the second half. Even Yandi got out of his early slump and finished the year with a 281 average and 65 RBIs, and Lau would hit 21 homers. At least we have a couple good hitters. This team still won more games than every Devil Rays squad, a testament to just how spoiled we've been over the past five years. However, there's no denying that the Tampa Bay Rays have undergone some serious changes over the year. With the departures of old namestays, the arrivals of new faces, and the new stadium on the line, the tides have certainly begun to shift in St. Petersburg. The next few years will be very interesting for this club, as they have the potential to resurface as a contender, or simply settle in mediocrity. With a young rotation of McClanahan, Springs, Boz, Bradley, and Pepio, and the hopeful rise of rookies like Junior, the Rays have the potential to be a great team in 2025. Where they go from here, only the future tells. But it's clear that we are about to enter a new age of Tampa Bay Rays baseball. And, as always, I and the rest of us will be here to watch as they continue to be the most interesting team in baseball. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and put my predictions for next year in here so we can have like a little time capsule thing. I think they're going to be better next year, you know. They'll probably make like a wild card spot. It'll be good. I'm thinking like high 80s in the wins, you know, like 88, 89 or something like that. Uh, they'll probably lose in the first round again, so whatever. Maybe, maybe they'll score more than one run in the playoff series this time. I don't know. All I'm saying is, next year's gonna be good, 
2026 is going to be even better. That's the year, baby. 2026 World Series champions. Book it right now. I'll see you in two years. All right. Thanks for watching. And I guess I'll see you next year for the next episode of the history of the Tampa Bay Rays. Bye!